today about uh, the present and the future of JavaScript. Um, my name is Christopher Plummer. I'm a developer at Upstatement. We are a design and engineering consultancy. Um, obligatory, we're hiring engineers. Um, today, I'm going to talk about JavaScript. Uh, any, begin any conversation about JavaScript really begins with ECMAScript, right? Uh, ECMAScript is the standard specification for JavaScript. It dictates how the language should function. Um, JavaScript is ECMAScript, or sorry, JavaScript uh, triple equals ECMAScript. Um, it's also a really terrible name. Uh, ECMAScript was always an unwanted trade name that sounded like a skin disease. That's uh, that's, Brent, I, that's the guy who invented JavaScript. Saying that. Um, JavaScript, or ECMAScript is a serious business. Uh, there's a standards body made up of engineers from companies like Google, Apple, Microsoft, uh, media companies like Netflix, nonprofits like Mozilla, and open source projects like jQuery, uh, as well as smaller consultancies. And they all contribute to the, uh, this language. Um, this working group uh, drafts a specification for the language, and that spec is ECMAScript. Uh, the first standard was drafted in 1999. Since then, change, as you may know, has been very slow. Um, the first update was published in 99. Uh, it was ECMAScript 3. If you're still supporting IE8 on your browser matrix, you're probably writing this. You're writing JavaScript from 17 years ago. Um, ECMAScript 4 was supposed to solve a lot of problems with the language. Um, but conflicts within the like working group that was supposed to write the spec uh, caused that spec to be abandoned in 2008. After 10 years of work, they just gave up on it. Um, there was essentially a lack of process to achieve consensus, and uh, there was feature creep, something we all compete with. So remember that this was the era of the second browser war, when browser manufacturers had proprietary features and implementations, Anybody who writes CSS today knows how hard it is for browsers to reach consensus on how a feature should be implemented. Um, eventually, these factions uh, settled their differences, and they worked out a process called Harmony for changing the language. And I'll tell you about that process later on, because it's really important. Um, so they, the first part of this was that they formed a tech, technical committee, uh, TC39. And TC39 is also <laughs> serious business. Uh, in 2009, TC39 published the first update, first major update to the language since 1999. It was called ES5. And again, if you're supporting IE8, you might have missed or known about these features and not been able to use them. I won't go into all of them. There's not too many. But uh, one of the things was a lot of new higher order array functions. Um, so in the past, maybe you've like uh, looped through arrays and for loops and stuff. We now have like a very declarative, easily readable way of going through a for loop. Here we're like we're skipping a for loop. So we're using a higher order filter function, um, and basically you pass in a function to that, and whatever uh, whatever your return value of that function is will be dumped into a new array. Um, there's also like a for each loop. Uh, this is a lot like jQuery's uh, each. It will just sort of, uh, it will work its way through each element in the, in the array, and um, you can have sort of uh, side effects come out of that. Um, there's also a new API for creating objects called object.create. This was introduced by Douglas Crockford. Um, we've got a, uh, an alien object in this case. Uh, and we've got a, a marklar object, and we're calling object.create passing in alien as the first argument. And so here we're essentially going to create a new uh, object called marklar, but it's going to inherit uh, elements from alien. And you'll notice it's got this, this name property with a value, and, and we've set this new flag <coughs> called configurable. There's a few of these flags, um, but this one ensures that you can't rewrite that property. So if we try and, and, and uh, change the value of uh, marklar.name to Bob, and then we call the announce method, we will still get marklar uh, because the name is no longer configurable. 
Um, and there were a few other items like headers and setters that were really important. Use strict. I'm sure everybody's thumping that in. Uh, I had no idea what that meant for months and months and months. Um, but we all, you know, by obligation, put that in our scripts. Um, now, if you practice resume-driven development, the next part of the talk is going to be especially important for you. Last year, TC39 published a new draft, ECMAScript 6. Um, or, should I say, uh, ECMAScript 2015. Um, I'll explain this name change. See, ECMAScript 6 took a really long time to complete. Uh, seven years, basically. And it had a lot of new features. Um, all of these are new language features introduced by ES6 or ES2015. And maybe that's too many, right? That's a lot to learn. Um, and it took too long to make this update. So TC39 decided to make smaller releases more often every year. And so now it's called the ES2015 to reflect the new pace of change. And uh, future releases will follow the same convention. Um, perhaps you missed this. It's already here. We already have ES 2016. Um, ES 2017 is only a year away. And it's not going to stop anytime soon. So you're probably like, at this like pace of change, how am I going to maintain, maintain my skills as well as my applications going forward? Um, so you're probably a little afraid, like, why bother learning any of this? You can get it all done now with old school JavaScript and jQuery. Um, let the kids have their brand new toys, right? Like, why bother learning it at all? Why are you even here? Um, it's important to know that this isn't a new framework. This isn't a trend or a fad. This is the language itself. And unless you plan on stopping web development entirely, you're going to run into this sooner or later, right? Core libraries and frameworks and tools are all moving into these, these new syntax and these new features. Um, not to mention, like, these new features just make the language easier to work with. Uh, many of them were borrowed from other languages, uh, as well as other, like, JavaScript libraries. And so they, like, essentially, they, they address a lot of the, the problems, like, of JavaScript that, you know, are born of JavaScript's, like, really rapid creation. Um, so what are these features I'm talking about? Uh, there's not enough time to cover everything. So I'm just going to talk about some of the things I use every day. And I'm going to go really fast through these, but the slides will be up so you'll be able to look later. Um, first, there's like small things, things that change the way you write JavaScript, syntax things. So we've got bona fide template strings. In the past, maybe you've created strings from a combination of other strings, and properties and objects and variables. Um, now we have like a nice, clean syntax for template strings. Everything in between that dollar sign curly brace uh, just gets spit out as a string um, and it gets all contaminated. Arrow syntax is another thing. Um, maybe you're calling, you're passing in a lot of anonymous functions, you're typing function all the time, it's a little bit verbose. We've got like a shortened syntax for this. Um, everything to the left of that arrow that you see is the arguments that get passed into an anonymous function. And everything to the right is the return value of that anonymous function. Um, there's more to the error syntax, though. And this is really important. You're going to use this a lot. Um, perhaps you've got some sort of object, right? And it has a property name. You've got a method. And within that run method, you're calling, um, you're, you're like creating a new uh, anonymous function, right? And you want to get like this dot name out of there, but the context of this has changed. And so you'll create a new variable self and say like, oh, variable self gets this. You might say variable that gets this, or underscore this gets this. Um, we can use a fat arrow to get rid of that little uh, extra variable dec declaration in there because inside of an, like an arrow uh, function, uh, the scope of this or the meaning of this is, is scoped to the enclosing. So these two, again, are equivalent. Um, default arguments. You've had this for years in PHP. Uh, maybe in JavaScript you're doing something like this. You're just kind of like uh, redefining the variable and um, checking the truthiness and such. Um, but now we can just have a default argument, just like you've had in PHP for years. Um, spread operators, these are neat. Uh, I like them a lot. 
here we've got the function get the first starship, and we inside that function we create a new variable and we set the uh, we set that to the arguments that are passed into the function. That way we can pass it an arbitrary number of arguments, and then we're going to return the first element of that array, the arguments array, essentially. Uh, we can shorten this a little bit and make it a little bit tighter. Um, this spread operator, those three dots there, cast whatever gets passed in to an array. So we, without declaring a new variable, all those arguments, the lack of that enterprise serenity, just get cast to the Starship's array. It works the other way, too. If you have an array, you can cast to comment the limited arguments. So here's like a really contrived example. Uh, we've got this example function. It takes two arguments, and we're just going to console log those. Um, We've got another function which will return that function, and we call it to apply on that, sort of forwarding the arguments in there. We can do something much simpler. Uh, we can just use that spread operator, and it will take that arguments array, and it will cast it into like comma uh, separated values. Uh, similar to this is destructuring. Um, here we've got a runner object. It's got a name and a job property. Um, we might want to set a variable name, and it'd be runner.name, and job is runner.job. We can make that much tighter and simpler. Um, we've got, this will essentially do the same thing as above. It's a little hard to explain until you start using it. I haven't figured out the right words for it, so um, Again, similar to that, we've got an object literal syntax like enhancement. We've got a few of these. Um, here, we have a function that returns an object. Um, that object has like a key value pair that are essentially the same. Um, we can just return an object declaring uh, the return values there for that object. We can just, as long as the key and value match, uh, they'll, they'll map essentially the same way as they do in there. We've got more object literal syntax stuff. In the past, you've created properties and you've used uh, anonymous functions say that like, oh, this Death Star object has a demonstrate firepower function. Uh, we can make it a little bit cleaner, get rid of that anonymous function, and just be very declarative about the way we're creating uh, methods. There's a class syntax. Um, as you know, JavaScript uses prototypal inheritance. And so you, you're probably used to setting um, methods on object prototypes. Um, and doing inheritance gets a little bit tricky. Um, and very confusing if you come from like a PHP or a Ruby or a Java background where you have bona fide classical inheritance. We have something like that now in JavaScript. We can actually make real classes that extend from each other. Um, a note here, this is not real classical inheritance. This is just syntactic sugar. Essentially the compiler will compile this into prototypal inheritance. Okay, so that was all syntax stuff. But what about things that change how you use JavaScript? We've got promises. This is probably the biggest thing. Um, in the past, you've created like you've, you've had asynchronous effects uh, and passed in functions to those or anonymous functions, and you get this like deeply nested uh, call. They call it callback hell. Uh, now we just have a very simple syntax for uh, expressing like functionality that we want to happen when things are resolved. So here we're going to get some uh, Ajax from spacejam.com, and then once that's completed, everything inside that function, everything we pass in there, will execute. And if we get an error, we can catch that. It's a lot like jQuery's deferreds. If you use deferreds, you'll recognize this. Object that assign lets you merge two objects. Here we've got a brundle object and a fly object. We can use object.assign to just merge them into a brundle fly. Uh, modules. You're probably creating modules like this right now, right? To keep things out of the global namespace. I hope you are. Um, this is a, the revealing module pattern. And we have to pass in dependencies in this interesting way. And we have to make sure that these scripts are all loaded in a very specific order. Because you know, this example does not use like a module loader. There's now a bona fide uh, syntax for importing modules. Uh, we can just import modules arbitrarily, and we can export whatever we want into uh, a new space. There's no module loader 
This is important. This is just the syntax. They haven't established what exactly the loading uh, procedure is. That's coming in the future. Um, we've got Latin constants now. We have real constants in JavaScript. Hooray! In the past, you've probably created variables and given them all caps and just crossed your fingers that nobody else in the future would overwrite those, right? Um, you've also probably done this thing where you've made variables inside of if statements and then wondered why like, they're bleeding into the function scope. That's just how JavaScript works. Now we can create real constants. Real constants that will throw a type error when you try and change them. And we can have block scope variables with left. So things like the Dr. Zayas variable here will not bleed into the outside scope. Um, it only exists inside that if block. We've got sets. Sets uh, are like arrays, but all the elements are unique. Here we've got an array. It's got its replicants. There's two ROIs, and we add a pris to it. And then when we console log it, we get two ROIs and two prises. Now we've got a replicants set, which only has unique elements in it. Right? You can keep pushing ROIs and Leons and prisons to this all day long, and they won't appear again. No more filtering your arrays. Just use sets. Um, there's an array from function, which is neat. Uh, maybe you want to create an array of like arbitrary length that has like arbitrary values. So you use a for loop, old school style. You can now just call array from, pass in an array like object. Any object with a length property is array like enough. Um, and the second argument to that is just a, another anonymous function um, that's going to spit those values into the array. And there's a bunch of other stuff. Uh, Unicode is going to be useful. Why don't we have Unicode in JavaScript? But you do now. Um, this is already here. There's a lot of features for this. Um, actually, there's not. There's only two new features in ES uh, 2016. Remember, they want to do smaller releases more often. Operator. And the next is array includes. Maybe you're looking for elements in an array by using index up. That's totally fun. Um, that makes sense. Uh, if you know what it is, if you're new to the language, that's really confusing. And you inevitably stack overflow. How do I find an element in an array? You get this response, and you're like, I don't get it. Now you just call includes. You just say, does this array include this string? Yes or no. It will return or include. So like, when can you use this magic sauce? Um, the good news is you can use most of these features today. Uh, they're supported in Chrome and Firefox and Safari, but not in Internet, Internet Explorer. Seriously, you have to wait till Internet Explorer dies until you can use these, so that's a couple years out. Um, but the good news is that there's an option for you. Whoa. Uh -huh. So that option is Babel. Babel is going to transform ES2015 syntax into ES5 to provide backwards compatibility. In a sense, it works a lot like SACS, right? Taking the SACS language and transpiling it into CSS. So we can see this in action, I hope. So here, on the left side, we're writing ES2015, and on the right, it transpiles it ES5. And so here we're just creating like a constant called spice, and if the spice is true, we'll create a new variable inside of there. It'll be a little front of This one is slow. <laughs> um, and you'll see that where we're using constant let, it's still using var on the right side. If we try and console dot log those uh, those fremen, we're going to get an, an error. Fremen is not defined. That kind of makes sense. If we try and create fremen outside of that if statement, you'll notice that it underscores the fremen inside the if statement. It kind of forces it to not be the same. Again, it's really ES5 on the right. Um, here, we can create a spice variable, and we try and reset it, and it just gives us an error if we don't make it. Cool. Um, I'm going to skip that for now. Um, so, Babel, what you just saw there, delivers uh, tomorrow's JavaScript problems today. 
Um, so what does any of this have to do with WordPress, right? Um, well, you can use Babel in your WordPress projects, and I'll show you how. So here's like a really bare bones WordPress theme. Not much in it, we've just got a source directory. And that source directory had two modules in it, uh, app.js and module.js. And if we look here, uh, app.js just imports the hello world module, or hello world uh, function from module. Um, and we've got this cons, uh, hello world. I apologize, I didn't pause at the right time. So what happens there is uh, app.js, well, I'll just go back. Sorry, folks. OK, app.js, we're going to import hello world from that module. Um, and we've got this const. We're going to create a new hello world object. And on window load, we will announce. Uh, we will call the announce method to announce some name. Great, and here's the module. Uh, it's got an announce method. And basically, it's just going to wipe out a bunch of uh, DOM and replace it with a message. Cool. Okay. So uh, we can include that very simply uh, just by using you know wp on q, and we can on q app.js. And this isn't going to work. I guarantee this won't work, and I guarantee we're going to get a type error. Check it out. Uh, unexpected token import, right? The browser has a, a, a syntax for importing stuff, but there's no mo like module loading system for it. The browser can't deal with this. So we're going to need two things. We're going to need Babel to transpile uh, that import into something useful. And we're also going to need a module loader. Um, if you're in the anti-tools, tools are bullshit crowd, uh, there's a door over there. You can go out that door. Uh, and you can come back in like two years, because that's how long it's going to take for IE to die. <laughs> Otherwise, like, grab NPM and let's keep going. First, we're going to need a module loader. We'll just use Browserify. It's pretty simple. NPM install Browserify. NPM is not that fast. Um, then we're going to attempt to call Browserify on our JavaScript, and this is going to bundle it, right? And we've got a source and a disk directory, um, and here we go, and we get an error. Uh, parse error. Import and export may appear only with source type module. Basically what that's saying is like, Browserify doesn't know what to do with the syntax. Browserify just bundles JavaScript. It doesn't bundle, bundle like ES2015 JavaScript. So we've got to start again. We've got to get a... Uh, Babel plugin. It's called Babelify. So let's install that. And now let's try calling Browserify again. Here's the source directory, and here's this. And let's call this transform. Let's use Babelify. And it doesn't work. It still doesn't work. There's one more thing we need. Babel needs to know what kind of JavaScript you're using. Are you using ES 2015, 2016, 2017? Uh, so we'll need just a couple more packages here. So let's start installing some presets. npm install Babel preset ES 2015 and 2016. And we're going to try this again. So we'll call browser fine. With the transform, we'll use Babel and check out Babel gets presets. So you can just set that flag. And it compiled. There was no errors. So let's just open up our text editor and take a look. And that looks like a big mess. Like you're probably familiar with OBM messes like that. There's some like minified JavaScript up there. But if we scroll down, look at our announce function. That looks legit. That looks like something Babel might have transpiled. Cool. So all we have to do now is like change what script we're going to unqueue. Instead of unqueuing source, let's just unqueue dist. And save and check it out. It wiped out the content on the left and said, hello, Bob, my name is Alice. We're no longer getting errors. Cool. But that's tedious, right? If you change a JavaScript file, you have to run that again. Change the file, run that again. So let's automate it. You could use Brunch or Gulp or Broccoli or whatever the flavor of the month uh, <laughs> like JavaScript code thing is. Or you could use NPM scripts. They're just fine for simple tasks like this. So let's use that. So when we use npm scripts, we can just install like a local browser, fine. That's just fine. We can also uninstall our global browser, fine. Get rid of our things that are mucking up our hard drive. 
And let's open up our text editor. We're going to open up package.json. And here's where you specify like, what you're going to do with these npm scripts. We'll put our babel config in here. So we'll take those presets out. First we'll set sort method here, and here's where we're going to set our presets. ES 2015, ES 2016, just like we did with the terminal command. And then we can just, just declare our script's property. And we're just going to call our build script build. And then what goes in here is just the same commands we ran from the terminal. Browser file, here's our source directory, destination directory, and our transform. Let's use Babelify, save. And now we can just call, let's save it quick. We can just call npm run build, and it, run, it ran that command line thing. We can open up bit. We can take a look, and that looks legit. That looks like it compiled what we needed it to. Refresh works just like a charm. You still have to run that command line thing, npm run build, so let's automate it. All we need to do now is pull in a package called onChange. Um, onChange allows us to watch files and then execute actions when they're done. So let's open up vim and open up package.json. And in our scripts, we're going to create a new script. It's going to be a watch script. And watch's job is to call onChange. And onChange's job is to watch this. It's going to watch source JS. It's going to watch for any change in any JavaScript file nested anywhere within source. And then after that, we can just say npm run build. And that will fire the action above, which will fire the build again. Check that. Save. Fresh npm run watch. We're watching, so on change is running. Didn't compile our JavaScript yet. We just want to go in and like save a file, see if it works. We'll go in and we'll change this. We will announce a different name. We'll announce Tomster. Save and quit. And look, it ran that browserify task. It watched that file, saw the change, fired npm run build. We can confirm this. Let's go over here. Refresh. Boom. Hello, Tomster. My name is Atlas. Do it again. Just approve it. We'll make another change. We'll change the name of the Hello World up to Sally. Save. Go to our browser. And hello, Tomster. My name is Sally. Great. You automated all this. Like, we didn't need grunt. We didn't need golf. We didn't need anything. <laughs> we did it all just with a few uh, terminal commands. So that's awesome. Uh, you can also use npm run. Uh, NPM scripts to like parallelize tasks, to cache values, um, to use uh, like you know, browser sync. But that's like for another time. You could go on to this example GitHub repo. You can pull this down. Um, hopefully it works for you. Um, <laughs> warranty void. Uh, you could fork this if you want to try it out. It's just a little demo. Um, and now, you can confuse all your coworkers <laughs> and your clients <laughs> with new JavaScript features and syntax. So, like, what does the future hold? And this is like my favorite part of this: is that like we're going to talk about how they make changes uh, to the language. So, DC39 has a GitHub uh, account, and they have a proposal process in there. And you can just read the proposal process. Basically, uh, there are four stages. Um, and the proposals are presented by members of DC39, and they start at stage zero and they'll work their way up to stage four. Um, and in order for a proposal to advance to the next stage, it has to meet certain criteria. So to get uh, to stage one, you need a sponsor and examples of usage. To advance to stage three and four, you need acceptance tests, uh, and you need significant usage in real-world applications. It won't be part of the language until people are using it, which seems like a catch-22 until you think, oh yeah, people are using these things with Babel. Um, at any point, proposals can be withdrawn, and that's really important. I'll show you later. Here's a proposal for decorators. Um, it's got a GitHub repo. This is Yubuda Katz's decorator proposal. You can go on this repo. You could submit an issue to this proposal. You could file a PR. Uh, you could comment on it. Um, so what are decorators? Decorators are expressions that return a function and kind of allow us to dynamically add or modify uh, a function uh, you know, within methods. Or you can even dynamically modify classes. But here we've got a read-only decorator that's going to set the writable uh, property on a function to false. And so we can 
now have a class that has a name uh, method that is read-only. And if we attempt to overwrite that, if we attempt to set it to something else, you'll get an error, cannot assign read-only property to name. That's really cool. You can wrap things with promises like that. You can have computed properties like that. These decorators are going to be fantastic. System.global. So while most of JavaScript is talking about like how to eliminate global scope, um, this is one that's trying to create a new global scope. It's going to be a new namespace, essentially. So right now, you're probably familiar with the window global namespace. That's where like jQuery and stuff get dumped. Um, but window doesn't exist in Node. Node uses something called global. Neither global nor window exist in, in the command line with like D8 or JSC. So now we hope to have a new global name namespace that will work in the browser, in Node, in the command line, anywhere you want. Cindy, uh, single instruction, multiple data. I'm not smart enough to understand any of that. All I know is it's going to provide uh, better performance in 3D graphics and cryptography and parallelized communication. Um, it's in stage three. Uh, it has a polyfill. And all proposals above stage one must have a polyfill. So you could grab that polyfill and start using this uh, today. Another one that's in stage three that has a polyfill, asynchronous functions. So asynchronous functions are like a major, major way of changing, again, how we do async code. Um, perhaps you're already using promises. Perhaps you have something like this. We've got a get Ajax function. It returns a promise. So we're going to get something from Space Jam. When that resolves, we'll return another promise, a send Ajax function, uh, that's going to like send that data to some derpy API we have. Um, and when that resolves, then we'll just console log it. It's a little verbose. We can simplify it. Async uh, keyword in front of function just wraps that function in a promise. And this await keyword is really neat. It sits there and it waits for a response before like essentially returning that value. Um, and so we can make our asynchronous code really clean and really readable. Um, so many of these proposals are uh, available to use in Babel as transforms. Remember I said had those like the S 2015 and the S 2016 presets. You can pull in specific <laughs> items. You can pull in all stage three items, um, all stage two items, and so on. And this is the primary means of testing these in real world applications. People like you and me trying out stage one, two, three, and four proposals uh, so that they can become part of the language. So here's a cautionary tale. Has anybody in this room ever wanted to watch an object for changes and then trigger an action elsewhere in the application uh, based on those changes, right? In the early days of two-way data binding, this looked really promising, and it was going to be adopted in the language. But object.observe came at a significant performance cost and increased application complexity. The immutable JavaScript crowd, the React folks, hated this thing. Um, and so, after a lot of debate, TC39 withdrew this proposal. Problem was, this proposal got to stage two before it was withdrawn, and it found its way into many libraries, including Node. And now those libraries have like an expensive and lengthy deprecation process, where they're going to have to remove those items or polyfill them in some way. So it's important when you're using proposals that are under like stage three to like just remember in your brain, uh, what I'm doing right now could break my client's application someday in the future. So JavaScript's going to continue to evolve, um, even as like WebAssembly and uh, other items open up the browser, like as them open up the browser to other languages. It's not going away, but it is definitely getting better. Um, the human inventory is just beginning. Uh, so that's me. You can like find me in those places or whatever, um, and I'll take questions. Thanks. <laughs> that young fellow with the glasses in the back. Yes. Um, so what does this mean for something like CoffeeScript? So what does this mean for something like CoffeeScript? Um, I hate CoffeeScript. <laughs> uh, some people have suggested that some of the ideas in CoffeeScript have found their way into JavaScript, and I think that's somewhat true. Um, 
What it really means, though, is that CoffeeScript was, was meant to address a lot of the failings of JavaScript and the shortcomings. Uh, so now that we have solutions for the problems that CoffeeScript was trying to address, I don't know what what purpose CoffeeScript like serves. Don't write CoffeeScript. If you're writing CoffeeScript, that's that's cool. <laughs> but you can also just write the actual spec, right? CoffeeScript isn't a real language. It's not a real like specification. It's just this weird thing that like transpiles into JavaScript. This is an actual JavaScript spec. I'd say stick to the real spec. Get as close to reality as possible. Anything else? Anyone? Right over here. TypeScript is awesome. Uh, <laughs> uh, this does not address any of the issues that TypeScript does. Um, TypeScript, as some of you may know, uh, solves a lot of bugs by simply uh, create, like making a statically typed version of JavaScript. You can use these two things interchangeably. Um, TypeScript is great. I'm seeing a lot of things move over there. So uh, this doesn't solve those TypeScript problems. Um, so TypeScript is totally cool. Keep going with it as you're doing that. Uh, yes, sir. So if you're using the variables inside the quotes, you know, the curly brace, um, are you using double quotes there or single quotes? Uh, okay, yes, template strings. I apologize, it's backticks. It's like a completely new, like, you could say it's like a, it's like a new literal, right? It's like a template string literal, essentially. Anybody else? 